this is Roger, thanks for dropping by. Sunday chat much earlier in the day today. We have some sunshine. Um, <laughs> doesn't make a huge amount of difference, doesn't it exactly light me up, does it? Oh, bang in the air there. Um, subject today really is going to wander around what if. We all do it. You know, what if I could do that? What if I could do this? Um, sometimes you just have to accept what you've got and put up with it. But um, before I can venture off into the what if that I specifically want to do today, we need to set the what is now, before we can speculate what if. Now, this year my winter temperatures are set on a thermostat with a heater, so they're, they're accurate. Yeah, And I adjust my thermostat twice a day, most days. I don't do it every day because sometimes I forget. But basically... The important one <laughs> is as it starts to get dark, obviously outside, temperatures are starting to drop, and I try and replicate that in here. So I set the thermostat at 15, which means the temperature in here goes down to 14, which triggers the heater and takes it back up to 15. And it, it runs like that until I alter it, basically, um, which is sometime in the morning. Normally, I let it get proper light before I start up in temperatures. Bear in mind this time of year the sun doesn't come round till whatever it is now. Oh, that's not right. <laughs> but not too late in the day today. Um, so once, if I've got a bright day like this, then I'll up that thermostat to 20 for the daytime. Yeah. Um, and by doing that, the other choice I would have is to leave that door open, but that's effectively sucking heat out of the house constantly then, which means I have to have the heating on a lot more. And basically I'm in one or two rooms, you know, so it's a, it's a bit wasteful. Woo! A bit wasteful. Kick the bucket. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, so I'd prefer to use the heater and the thermostat in here, which is what it's for, basically. You need the door shut, except for when I'm to and from in. Um, so that's what happens as far as temperatures are concerned in here. As far as light is concerned, I've left one layer of shade netting on there because I don't want to overcook my um, oncidium types, of which there are quite a few over in that side of this place. Um, and direct sun on them through glass with no shading is probably a bit much, even in the winter time. So. Uh, Bearing in mind I have gone over the top with the Oncidium light in the past and had to make a major adjustment. The light level on the roof, all shading comes off of there, but it's opaque um, polycarbonate, the roof, and then it's got a layer of bubble wrap. So there's no direct sun ever comes in the roof. Uh, it can't. Um, and then on that end, this time of year there is no shading, that's bare glass. But it's, it's well filtered light even when the sun comes round there because glass is soaking wet. <laughs> it's, it's quite cold outside today. So this is, it, again, it's the, you know, the difference. The um, warmer air in here hits that glass and just draws the condensation out of it. Now round this end, we do actually have a glass panel there which you never get to see. And there is one here. But my black cloth obscures quite a bit of that, which I use as a backdrop for filming. And in addition to that, the outside of that glass has got that white um, chalky paint that you get that um, rubs off with the cloth if you want to get rid of it. Um, and I used to do that. I used to take it off for the winter and then paint it back on in the spring. But I just leave it on there now. Basically, the sun sets there in the winter time, literally. So it's never going to come in this glass, is it? Come the summertime it does, because it sets there. So this, this little window here and this little window here are bright sunlight as the last few hours go of the daytime. So that's where I am. Reasons. Um, the low temperature at night is not as low as I used to. It used to go down to 12. Now it's only 14. So I've gone up 2 degrees. Um, the reason for going that low was my winter resting dendrobiums that need that drop in temperature and in most cases an increase in light, um, which is removing shade netting. You know, it's a relatively simple operations, practiced with slight variations over many years, basically. So, um, you know, I've got notes that say 
last year I took the sh first layer of shade netting off on this date, things like that. I keep those notes because they're a reminder of what works and perhaps what didn't work as well. Yeah, so they can be adjusted year in, year out. And the main thing that they will get adjusted for, this is an outside place basically, what would be the thing that would change when the shade netting comes off? It's the weather, isn't it? What if we get a late autumn? One of those really nice autumns. Um, I think it's called an Indian summer or something, where, you know, the, the, the good weather just carries on, right on out of October and into November. It does happen. Well, that's going to keep things growing longer. <laughs> I mean, when, when the rains come, I mean, it sounds like you're in one of those uh, parts of the world where they have a rainy season. Yeah, we have a rainy season in, in this country. It's, it's, it's called five or six months of the year normally. Sometimes all of the flipping summer as well. But we don't, strictly speaking, get a, a rainy season, but we do get a lot more rain in the winter than we do other times of year, like probably a fair few parts of the world. So, um, right, let's move on to what if. Um, no, I need to backtrack again. Um, what's in here? Um, dendrobiums, lots. Somebody mentioned about um, to do with renaming and classifications and all that stuff that really gets on your wick, doesn't it? Um, but basically about the dendrobiums, well at least they've got their sections and their sections dictate their culture. Uh -uh. <laughs> oh, no it doesn't. Within those sections there are six uh, main sections where most of the plants are but there are many many other sections as well and some of those dendrobium sections have got one plant in it that's how silly that's got um, but at the end of the day you can get warm growers and cool growers in the same section so you've got to come down to plant level you can't rely on the section I mean when you look at the Latoria section pretty much across the board these are warmer growers that don't need the high light you could do a general classification there. There may be a few exceptions in there, but there's not many. But that's just one section. Some of the other sections, are the, the plants are all over the flipping place. Um, so get down to plant level for the dendrobium. So we've got dendrobiums, um, we've got the cooler growers, not necessarily winter resters. We've got the winter resters, not all of those need the chill. Yeah. We've got Latoria types, which run in with the um, Phalaenopsis type dendrobiums as far as their care and temperatures are concerned, because they don't like to get cold. Well, they do in here. They don't like it, but they, they get the cold. Um, and then there are other dendrobiums that don't really come into any set, really. You know, they like reasonable light, um, don't like to dry out when they're growing, don't like to stay wet when they're not. You know, it's, uh, it varies. Then there's the Oncidium set. In amongst there, you've got the Miltoniopsis. I wouldn't recommend treating those the same as your other Oncidium types. They don't like the heat and they don't like the bright light. Whereas some Oncidium types love bright light. They, they can go right up to Cattleya type light. Then there are the, the Cattleya Alliance. They're not all warm growers. Some of those come from higher elevations and actually would get, naturally, lower temperatures. So there's a mix in here, there's a couple of Syllogenes lurking, there's a couple of Bulbophyllums, Phyllums, whatever you want to say, uh, a few oddities, some Sarcochylus, they're not doing very well, some Masdevallias, Restrepias, my Restrepias do okay in here, it's a pity the Masdevallias don't, a couple of Draculas, again, not doing brilliantly, and a couple of Vandas, some other Vandacious types, so there's a mixture in here, and as a consequence, Whatever I do in here, I have to try and make it work for everything. Now we can do what if. What if that thermostat got set to 18 for the night time and 24 for the daytime? What have I just done? Well, first of all, I've just spent quite a bit more money on the lecky. Um, but what have I just done? I've just turned an intermediate room into a warm room. Now, with a minimum of 18, I could grow Phalaenopsis out here and they'd be happy in the winter. My Psychopsis would suddenly be better off. 
Mylotorias and Phalaenopsis type Dendrobiums would be better off. Most of my Oncidium types wouldn't stop growing in the winter because it's a bit too cool for them. But, there's always a but isn't there, if you start up in your temperatures to accommodate warmer growers and constant growth for those that slow right down in the winter because you can't do the temperatures, what else are they going to need if they're going to start growing? Going to need the day length. They go together. So if a plant is trying to grow, it ain't going to do very well with eight hours of daylight. It's just going to interrupt what's going on within the plant. Um, so you would need to think about lighting. I'm going UK here. Um, you'll have to vary this according to how far north of the equator or south of the equator and how far away you are or how close you are. Um, but yeah, if I took the minimum to 18 in here, um, my Orangus would do better, my Vanders would do better, possibly even bloom in the winter time. Some of my Oncidiums would suddenly continue to grow throughout the year. My Zygo would probably keep going instead of slowing up. My Cattleyas would love it. So just four degrees. I'm only doing centigrade, I'm not doing that old fashioned flipping stuff where you have to move about 50 degrees to get any flipping difference. One, not to a hundred is fine. You can cope with that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, just four degrees. Other changes, what if? What if I set up this place to be artificially lit when it's not lit properly by natural daylight? Yeah, you can get light sensors that will turn things on and off. They do exist, yeah? So you could have everything arranged so that the lights would get at them. Now that would be a big problem. Do you know the best thing to have artificial lighting on is vertical growing. Mounted orchids or plants in pots that are hung vertically because you can have the light a set distance away from them pointing straight at them and that's absolutely brilliant. The other alternative is to have the lights horizontal above your shelf. That's all right if you've only got one shelf. What if you've got a tier of three shelves? You're not gonna get much light on the second and third one down, are you? So do you need another set of lights for each shelf? And then how many shelves have you got? The number of lights is going up. You'd have to have a light here, one. Possi I could get away with another couple of strips under there. Over there I would need one. Uh, and, and now all of a sudden I'm pointing lights downwards. Where are the mounts going to go? It messes them. That's why the lights aren't in here this year. Because it doesn't work. I can't. The two powerful lights I've got, which are superb um, lights, they're really good stuff. But because of their power, I can't, I daren't get plants too close to them. And how do you angle them such that most of the plants can take advantage? You end up with some plants that are getting none, because they're behind the lights, like these up here, because I have the lights pointing this way. Yeah, well there were some behind the lights, so I had to move those and find somewhere else for them to go and suddenly things are getting very crowded and you've got wires all over the place. Um, electrician's nightmare. It is anyway out here but um, <laughs> I mean you've got so you'd need to sort lighting out basically if you wanted to grow warmer but some warm growers are shady plants they're not all bright light and some of the coolest growers are bright light so what about the other way then? We've done the what if bumping up the temperatures, yeah? Now in the summer, the heater would still be needed because in our summer, your night temperatures can drop quite a bit below 18 and pull your temperature down, you know, in a place like this, yeah? So if you're gonna grow with that minimum of 18 degrees, your heater needs to stay there year in, year out and just have that minimum temperature set, yeah? So that it kicks in when it's necessary and stops it dropping down. Um, strictly speaking in our summertime, if you've got a nighttime temperature via a heater at 18 degrees, the weather should raise it up during the day, but there will be periods when it doesn't and you've then got a constant temperature of 18 maintained by your heater. 
you need to raise it during the daylight hours. The plants need that difference. If you keep the temperature constant, it affects their growth. Now, some orchids take no notice of that at all and grow fine. And others either don't bloom or, or don't grow well or just sit there doing nothing. That difference between day and night temperature is important for um, most orchids. Uh, most plants, actually. I'm going to stick into orchids here. So that's the what if going upwards. Now, what if I decided that it's not going to happen as things are at the moment, because all of my money coming in is either YouTube money or my pensions. So, you know, <laughs> a recession doesn't affect me. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, really, because some people in dire straits at the moment because of what's going on. Um, yeah, so what if I decided that I couldn't afford to run this place at these temperatures and I wanted to grow cool? So, well, adjust the thermostat. Instead of letting it drop to 14, let's go down to 10. Things like Mazda Valleys and that would love that drop at night. They'd love it. The Strepias, all those cooler growers, the Miltoniopsis. But the majority of my plants aren't cooler growers. There are those that would put, the Oncidiums would put up with that drop in temperature at night. Most of them would still be okay. They wouldn't stop dead in their tracks. The Vanders would probably die. <laughs> they probably wouldn't make it. My Psychopsis probably wouldn't make it. The few Phalaenopsis isn't here. But they're not going to have that. It's too cold. The Cattleyas might put up with it. Some would. Uh, Lalia Anceps would put up with it. That's a notorious cooler grower than most, so that would be okay. But most of the cattleyas would either stop growing or start going downhill. Um, possibly slowly enough going downhill that it, as it starts to warm up again in the spring, they might kick back in again. But if you're going to grow cool, it's not only allowing the temperature to drop down at night, you've got to stop it going up during the daytime. That is not as easy as it sounds, both in your home, because you live there, you, t you don't want to walk around in a blinking great fur coat and a scarf and a hat on, do you? So um, having cool in the house is not as easy as it sounds, unless you've got a north-facing room with a nice big window and you can turn the heating off. You might get away with it. But come the summertime, we've been having a few heat waves lately. Well, if the outside of your house temperature is 30 plus degrees, the inside of your house is going to follow suit. Uh, it might not make it right up to 30 degrees, but it's probably going to get up to 26, 27. It's too warm now. And what about out here? i got glass. Now, I can put the best shade netting to stop heat getting in is to move it away from your glass and have a double layer. So you have a, a, a couple of inches gap shade netting and then something like six inches gap, another layer of shade netting. That can be done by constructing some frames outside and I've seen some people that not only construct, construct those frames but they make their second layer of shade netting, the one on the outside that they can get at, like a curtain and it's on rings on a bar and on a dull day, zoom. on a sunny day, you've got to be there to do it mind. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so you've got adjustable shade netting. So rather than having it like, I mean, I screw mine on basically, literally with screws. Um, but yeah, so growing cool in, 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 in this country in here would be incredibly difficult and would not be successful during the summer months when it's sunny because I wouldn't be able to keep it cool enough. Ways of keeping stuff cool, you need to get the heat out. Uh, if it's going to get in, it needs a way to get out. And the best way to let it out is the roof, because it rises anyway. And the best cooling systems I've seen that are not air conditioning units or swamp coolers or anything along those lines is a large extractor fan in the roof. That really does take the heat straight out. But if you're going to suck the heat out, somehow or other, some other air is going to need to replace it, so you need some vents, and they're best on the lower end of the, down near the floor, preferably on a side that doesn't get any sun, which is a shady side to your unit, whatever it is.
and then you'll be sucking in cooler air. But in a heat wave, like I've said, if it's 30 degrees outside, you're going to suck in air at 30 degrees. That's not going to do your cool growers any good, is it? So, what if I grew cool is not going to happen. What if I grew warm could happen. I could achieve that, but I'd probably need to seriously think about lighting. The warm growers would be happy with just the temperature changing. Now they wouldn't grow very well in the winter because of the low light, you know, the um, short days, etc. But they'd still be okay. It wouldn't be detrimental to their health, they'd be okay. Um, but there are some that you've pushed their boundary from not being that comfortable in the winter to being quite comfortable, thank you very much, which means they're going to grow. You know, if you think about it, oncidium types, in the main, don't have a rest. Their new growths are often kicking off before the blooms have even dropped. Yeah, they, they, they're at it all the time if they've got ideal conditions. Many of them, not all of them. That'll include the intergenerics, the brassias, you know, the miltonias, all those other things that kick in there, some that you can't say, <laughs> some that you've never heard of. The Oncidium Alliance is quite big. Um, but yeah, so, you know, if you're going to kick things into growth that wouldn't normally be, then they're going to need the light. They're going to need normal daylight hours to keep them happy. So you'd have to think about lighting. So if I wanted to grow warm in here, I'd have to sort the lights out. There would be quite a few orchids in here that are not going to like it that warm in the winter time or any time. So we'd have to have a clear out. That would probably mean sacrificing my winter resting type dendrobiums. Um, that would be things like a Nosman, the, the Nesta. Um, Various others would not be happy with a warm winter, um, probably wouldn't bloom very well. Nobilies probably would reduce their blooming. They wouldn't stop, but they'd reduce. Um, so some things might have to go, but then they could be replaced by other things. My new genus this year was Renantheras. Well, they'd love that extra temperature. They'd love it. So instead of only having three, one of which is struggling, we could have a more of a variety. Um, Vanders, I hate to say this, <laughs> they don't do much for me, I'm afraid. I find them scrappy plants, the, the, the uh, monopodial growth, often with loss of leaves lower down. Um, the fact that they hold their leaves so long, they get knocked and nicked, and you know, if they get bug damage on them, it's there forever, that sort of thing. Um, and they appear to grow best bare-rooted, providing you can keep the hydration going and dunk them and give them a good soak and everything. So they, they take more work. And for me, you know, okay, my big blue vanda, when it blooms, is absolutely gorgeous. And they do last a nice long time. But the plant takes up an awful lot of space and it's getting bigger. Every year it's growing another five or six leaves, which is, means it's that much longer at the end of the year doesn't lose anything off the bottom, that stays the same. So it's getting bigger and bigger. And eventually, where it's hanging now, it won't be able to stay there because the roots will get tangled up with the shelving underneath, or the pots underneath. At the moment, I've got part of that shelf that I can't use because of the vanda roots. Yeah, so they're not necessarily my favorite plants. Um, so we'd have to have a a sort out. We'd have to get rid of some that wouldn't be happy if I grew warm, but I could get some more in that would be happy. But I think I would have to sort lighting out. But then if I got rid of quite a bit because it wouldn't be happy, I would then be a lot more able and to do the lights, wouldn't I? There'd be less plants, there'd be less things to try and shuffle around to get the lighting to work. And again, if you get a good light trigger, light meter, whatever you want to call it, that triggers, you know, turns things on and off, they do exist, that's got quite accurate settings, those lights might even come on in the middle of the summer because you've got a storm overhead and it's gone, you know, when you get those almost inky black clouds come over <laughs> and it rains spots as big as tennis balls, you know, your lights would come on. They compensate for that really bad day that you've just had, or part of that day. So, you know, that would be a form of automation. That type of unit is not that cheap. 
uh, lighting control like that, but they do exist, they are there. I worked for a company once, um, I won't say which one, but um, <laughs> there's one in most high streets and you go in there to get books and games and that sort of stuff. Um, but basically they did our, we had a nine story building in Swindon, which I was on the top floor when I was working in, uh, that was when I was programming. And um, they did the whole of the sunny side of the building with vertical blinds that twist like that. And they were light controlled. So when the sun came out, they closed round. So it stopped the heat getting in the building and stopped us getting all hot and sticky. And light that was so bright it almost blinded you. And then if it was a dull day, they'd open up. And you'd have natural light. So they worked well. There was a downside. They also had a wind sensor. <laughs> and when it got a bit windy, they had to stay, I think it was shut because the wind caught them and started to rip them off the building. So nothing's perfect, is it? Um, but yeah, there are, there are light sensor units that would turn things on and off like a set of lights. So it could be done. Um, as I'm running at the moment, it's classed as intermediate, which means some of the warmer growers don't like the winter, some of the cooler growers don't like the summer. And some of them are fine all year round, but they slow up in the winter because of the short days, even though the temperatures are okay for them. And then there are some that slow up in the winter because of the short days and the lower temperatures at night. So they slow up twice. They're very slow or almost stop. So, uh, but you need to know that. And that's the something that that knowledge builds up over years. And there are plants, like on a mount, oh, it needs water in every day. It'll dry out in a few hours. Well, yeah, but if it's not growing, <laughs> because it, why is it not growing? Too cold at night and short days. Cuts off its growth pattern, slows it right down. Well then it doesn't need water in every day, does it? What's it going to do without water? You know, so you have, you have to sort of make adjustments, make adjustments. So that's it for today. I thought about what if, what could I do here that would be different? Taking it up to warm growing could be done. Plants I would, I won't say lose, but they either wouldn't do so well or wouldn't be worth keeping if I did that, were all of this cool section, that's Mastervalius, Draculus and Restrepias, it wouldn't be worth, some of the Restrepias might hang in there because they don't seem to be affected by the heat. Um, not so much as the other pair, the, the Mastervalius and the, I'd probably not get away with my Miltoniopsis without that drop at night, they, they don't like staying warm all the time. Um, so that's three, four types of plants that immediately wouldn't do so good. Some of my dendrobiums would probably not perform very well, but they might be worth hanging on to, to see over a couple of years, just see the difference. Because uh, when you look up those winter resting types, when you look up the weather pattern from the areas they come from, it doesn't get that cold at night. It's just that the the daylight is brighter, a lot of them come from deciduous forests, and this is, this is where that sort of pattern comes in. So they follow the, grow, the pattern of the trees and dump their leaves annually, and they don't get much rain. So they're much, much drier, and it is cooler. It's not cold, not what we would call winter in the UK, uh, where we don't seem to be getting cold winters anymore. Somebody mentioned snow the other day, and I thought, ah, I remember snow. Mm -hmm. Something that, as a kid, we had every year, several lots. Not anymore. But it's not getting any warmer. There's no climate change. It's not getting any warmer. You know, the fact that we used to go st skating on the frozen fields down Christchurch. We've got two rivers in Christchurch. One of them floods. You've only got to look at it. It floods the floodplain. It's what it's there for. That used to freeze solid. We used to go skating on there. We used to <laughs> try playing ice hockey on our bikes. <laughs> Spent more time off on our A than we did actually playing. So anyway, I could do a what if and go warm. I could grow warmer. Could increase that minimum night temperature and use the thermostat to make sure I got a reasonable rise during the day. Um, and a lot of things would do better, but some things wouldn't some things would be better off just gone and not bother with them. Would I miss them? 
probably not because I could get some different stuff in yeah perhaps increase some of the other things so it would be a possibility but uh, I've often said at some point I'm gonna have to get out of here <laughs> boy is that gonna be fun uh, still one day it will have to be done and um, you know it will have to be done uh, you know it, come that time by hook or by crook this lot has got to come out and be transported somewhere else and for a period of time that might end up being in a house in a room and I will have to set the lights up but then I'd be designing their new home temporary albeit temporary based around the lights I would get floor stands possibly on wheels to hold the light with an adjustable angle so I could move the light to where I wanted it you know I'd, I'd just plan it and get it done but that will have to happen sometime but, um, uh, we shall see I even had, I even looked up some prices on conservatories and my theory is that I'm moving to Wales the rules are different in Wales they flipping always would be wouldn't they but basically in this country um, it's called a permitted build or something along those lines and you can have a conservatory if you want one there are a few things you have to watch out for um, but in Wales the rules are stricter um, certainly the size of it um, but in some areas in Wales you wouldn't be allowed to have one because you'd spoil the quaintness of the area or something like that so there are stricter rules so it might not be possible so uh, without a conservatory the alternative would be the greenhouse and in some areas you can't have one of them either <laughs> it spoils the look of the place apparently so you know things would have to be looked up and sorted out and who knows I'm, I may end up living in Wales and having to grow my plants indoors many grow their plants indoors. This would not be the end of the world. It might restrict the numbers, but it wouldn't be the end of the world. But I saw a very nice lean-to conservatory. Um, providing you had a pair of doors like this to current building regulations, as far as insulation, support, and everything are concerned, you can put a lean-to um, greenhouse on. Um, depending on where your boundaries are, you might be limited to three metres maximum height. But in some places, depending on the boundaries, you could go up to four. But I don't see any point in going that high. <laughs> if I hung anything up there, I'd never reach it, would I? Three metres is more than enough as far as a, a lean-to's height would be. And that was 4.25 by three metres. And affordable. Yeah. So it could be done. How long it would take to get the flipping thing ordered, delivered and built is another story. <laughs> another room full of orchids while I'm waiting. Anyway, we all play what if. Um, having messed about with um, you know, getting Jeff's plants out and sorting out that um, National Dendrobium collection, something like his would suit me down to the ground. I've always liked the idea of a pit greenhouse where half of the greenhouse is underground and you go down steps to get to the doors. I'd love a greenhouse like that. The amount of stored heat at that depth is quite incredible. So you, you wouldn't need as much on the heating front. You have only got half the glass to worry about shading. Yeah? There's, there's benefits for a, for a pit greenhouse, isn't it? So most orchid greenhouses were built and designed that way a long, long time ago. Um, but I couldn't possibly need one as big as that because I couldn't keep up with the workload. And I, in my opinion, I've got some automation in here, but if you've got a fully automated system with um, humidity sensors, sprinkler systems for watering, what's there left to do? I'm not sure that that is still a hobby at that point, is it? You know, if you can walk away for four weeks at a time and know that everything's okay because it's fully automated, to me it's the hobbies going away at that point, so I wouldn't be that keen. I like to have hands on, you know. So this is probably as big a collection as I could ever have. And even this is a bit big. It keeps growing, doesn't it? I keep saying no more orchids. 
Uh, but I don't want to be left out. I don't want to be... Every, loads of people say no more orchids, and they all get some more. Well, why should I be the only one that doesn't? <laughs> Except that logic, if you like. <laughs> anyway, that's it for today. We can all play what if. Um, and just because you, you can get set in your ways, just because this is the way you currently grow your orchids, sometimes take two or three steps back, scratch your head and look at it again, as though you were possibly thinking of starting from scratch. Would you do it the same second time round? And if not, have you not just redesigned where you grow your orchids? See you next time. Bye for now. Thank you.